the Polyglot Gathering is brought to you by italki. Become fluent in any language. So we have two empty spots. Mikhail, Michael, yeah. So go home. Hello, my name is Michael and I want to talk about German and Czech dialects in Bohemia, in the historic situation. First, a map of Czech, Czech Republic. So this is the Czech Republic. In this area, formerly German was spoken, and in Czech Republic, they have two main dialects: the Bohemian dialect and the Moravian dialect. And the line is quite through the country. And at the border, there are two language islands. Um, which were German speaking exactly on the border and if you continue also the border of the main German dialect families is exactly meeting here where the westernmost point of Czech Republic between Upper German and Lower German um, when you continue That's all I want to say. Any comments, questions? <laughs> What's the sound difference between uh, the Bohemian and the other one? Actually, I don't know exactly, but it's a bit more dark. So, Moravian. Can you imitate No, <laughs> I cannot. Although my ancestor came exactly from this point and this point. <laughs> Thank you very much. The next one is Max. Namaste. Um, I guess I don't have to ask which language this is. Yes, nice. So, um, India is weird, but also, <laughs> I mean, what do you say after Namaste? In Hindi, it would be Kesako. Um But can anybody guess the language Vanakam Yipadirika? Yep, exactly. So, Indian as well, then Namaskaram Zukumtane. Good, my Indian friend is not here, I see. Um, it's Malayalam. And Hegidea, Kasayahes. It's just five different languages in five different states, and that's just a fourth of the country. I was traveling through the country, and every state has a different script and a different language. Sometimes they didn't even understand each other Indians. Um, not everybody spoke English there, which is completely fine, but it was very strange for me as well. I, I started learning like the basics, like, hello, how are you, in each of one of those. And it didn't really help me because once you passed on another hundred kilometers, you you couldn't use it anymore. <laughs> um, it's 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 not just weird India; it's also marvelous because you might be driving through streets with with green signs with green flags for because it's an Islamic festival at that moment. It was um, in January, so it was the day of Muhammad, I think. Sorry if anybody is Muslim here. I don't really know which day it was. Um, then you might be driving through streets with red flags for the C N P I, the Com Karl Marx Party India. I didn't know that existed. And then you get uh, come through streets like this. I'm I'm German, and I'm already nervous just making <laughs> just doing this just to make a point. I mean, this is this makes it better because it kind of looks like a 
like a smiley, I guess. <laughs> because now it has eyes. <laughs> this is Indian, everybody. It's not the German stuff. Um, and it's a sign for auspiciousness. So, I was, I sometimes felt out of place. Sounds good? Yeah. Um, and uh, you can get lonely, of course, in, in places where this is on the wall, even though it, it kind of looked nice back there with more colors, more than red and black. Um, anyways, once you get to a point where you can't use your own language and you cannot express yourself fully in a place like this, what do you do? Here you can cheat if, you, if you're speaking a foreign language and you don't know how to express the sentence you try to use. You use a real language like English or whatever, but what if that doesn't work? What if you can retreat to your comfort zone, to your mother language? Well, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and like we heard, maybe if some of you guys were in Tim's talk earlier, it's basically because you, your whole identity is also attached to that language. And it's not, it's your identity and it's very precious. I mean, the mother language is for most of us. Um, the language where we heard, first heard, where we first said our first words, where we first heard I love you, where we talked to our parents. Um, and it's awesome to share it because you have a gift. And we all know as polyglots, there are people who speak maybe just some random language in Africa, but we're learning that language, so they already know more than we do. And the point of all this is, we all have a gift, our own mother language, and we can share with other people, and you basically have the key to entire culture. So, I think it's awesome to be here to, to learn from other polyglots, or just native speakers of, well, my son's not here, but Portuguese and French and Serbian and Russian. So, thank you for sharing, and keep on doing it. Thank you. The next one drawing another map will turn it over. Uh, I don't see Cesco. No? In the other room, okay. So after we can move to the other room. Uh, we have now three spots free. Uh, now Ursula. So we are going to... You can turn it. Okay, so Ursula, now... I just said speak to me in, in uh, Chinese if you happen to be randomly walking around and see me elsewhere. My whole point is to not speak English. I'm doing that right now. <laughs> I'm doing that right now. So on my sign it says kind English, bitte. This is an exception. Uh, I'm actually studying German because I live here and one of the things that really irritates me about German is that when you have all these articles that don't have a sense of uniqueness until you get to the third letter, it's a little bit of a waste of cognitive processing. <laughs> and so I, I speak Finnish and so if German is just simply not that hard in terms of cases and I wanted to do something, um, I wanted to create a matrix for cases that was just really easy. And, of course, if you don't know what something is in the nominative, who cares what it is in any other case, because you're going to fuck it up. So, um, anyway, um, I have a very simple mathematical uh, number representations system that I just thought of about two months ago. Um, if anyone is really attracted to numbers, this is probably going to work really well for you. If you're not attracted to numbers, figure out another way. Maybe it's colors, maybe it's shapes. The same concept will apply. And also, I'll have to say that the order in which I'm doing this might not be the order in which you're used to or prefer. So develop your own order. But, dia di das is very common. So we've got dia di das and of course di. And as you see, We've got d, 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 and then we have a, e, a, e. So we've got sounds here that are not just, well, this, this is the same thing, the function is different. Um, scrap that. This a, and then we have den. We all know this is now accusative, uh, nominative, accusative, next. We all know. And that, yeah. 
Yeah, you will now. Uh, <laughs> das D. And then you have dative, which is the order in which I'm doing this again, to pick your own order. We have uh, dem. Yeah, I know it. <laughs> this is super small, and it's just this. This is just too much to deal with. Um, and we have des. So here we have unique, 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 unique. And then there's a bunch of reuse, which I, I got really annoyed with. Here's another data, another reuse. Here's another reuse. And then we have got reuse here. We've got reuse. Here, sorry, there. La la la. And so we've got des here. Shit's reused here, and then we have dear, dear, dear. So it's like, I don't want to fucking deal with this. So, <laughs> I want to do one, two, three, two, four, two, three, two, five, one, five, four, six, one, six, one. Now I have four pin code numbers for my fake bank accounts. <laughs> That's, I don't actually have fake bank accounts, obviously. <laughs> but the concept here is you're already using this in your real life. You you go to the cash machine on a regular basis, you go to your bank, you're like, I don't want to have to figure out, you pull out my number, I just memorize it. If you like numbers, again, if you don't like numbers, forget about this, use colors or something else. But if you don't want pin codes, just change it into a credit card. One, two, three, two, four, two, three, two, five, one, five, four, six, one, six, one. There's your credit card. Lots of money here. So <laughs> this is a basically 90% of German grammar. So all these fucking charts in your books are like, oh, if you have this, then do this. If you have this, then do this. It's like there's an entire website, if then, then, then this, ITTT or whatever. This is basically German grammar. So if you have something in the accusative that requires der, it's right here. Sorry, this is D. <laughs> um, if you if you have um, that re requires something in the day, you're going to go down to this unique number, which is going to identify this as DIN. If you have something in dative, a, a, a dare nominative in dative, you're going to know your matrix in your head instantaneously, and you're saying, okay, that's DIN because it's number five. If none of this makes sense to you, or some of this is a little a bit uh, uh, sketchy, ask me afterwards because I'm a little bit short on time, obviously. Um, but if you're looking at a simple matrix of 16 digits and you like numbers, it's just there for you to sort of cheat on any exam that you need to do for any German uh, certification. And so uh, if I say something like, um, uh, ich kaufe uh, den Hund. So I, well, that was a dare word, right? So I just go down here and I, I know, oh, that's number four in my head. I already have that. I have the cheat sheet in my head. I don't have to write anything down. So, if you have any questions about this, or if you want to do uh, anything with colors, if you want to do shapes, uh, we could experiment personally, and I can talk about this a little bit more. Thanks. Thank you. The next one is Mike. Hello, John. Okay, I want to talk quickly about um, raising the next generation of polyglots. Mm -hmm. Now, if any of you were in Alex's talk earlier, um, he talked about how um, his mom unsuccessfully tried him to get to speak Greek. And um, this is a subject close to my heart as well, because I made a, a similar mistake when, um, well, actually a worse mistake, when trying to bring up my um, children. Um, my son was born in 2000, and I'd only just moved to England about two years before then, and I was still working on improving my English at the time. That was my excuse anyway. But um, really, the only person in our house that made any effort to to speak any other language with my with my son was my wife. So um, we all know the benefits of of language learning, and um, it is really at an early age that it's quite important to make a start. Um, so, um, yeah, when my first child was born, I obviously, as I said, I neglected to teach him any German or French, which I'd done a lot of at school as well. Um, fortunately, he's developed a, a love of languages now himself. Um, but um, we've tried to sort of remedy that with our, uh, with our following two children. Um, and um, 
question really is, how do you incorporate language learning into your everyday life? Um, how do you do it so the children actually enjoy it and don't just turn off like um, Alex's experience was? Um, so the first thing is resources at that age are fairly difficult to find. Um, you need something that's really, really simple that the children can interact with and hopefully that they're familiar with. Now in a couple of languages you'll find books that have been tra translated into practically every language under the, under the sun. You've got The Very Hungry Caterpillar, um, Kleine Robin immer satt in German, or um, The Bear in Jagd, We're Going on a Bear Hunt. Um, you can use those sort of things, which is what we did. Um, but yes, the benefits of starting language learning early, really. Um, actually, this is one point where, where I want to mention that despite my reticence of using any German with my son, strangely enough, before he was born, I spoke to him in German. And after he was, bo he was born, he wouldn't recognize my voice in English. So that, to me, was a, an interesting sign that right at an early age, children can pick that sort of thing up. And the research actually is out there to, to prove that as well, that especially in the, first, um, in the first couple of years of a children's life, they find it much easier to, um, to link up with different language sounds. Uh, when you're born, you all babble in the same language, basically. It's after six months that your brain, as a, as a child, starts to tune out language sounds that it thinks it won't need and starts to sort of specialise. And that process sort of goes on until age six, six years old. So that time window is really, really important. Obviously, you've got other advantages as an adult learner, but why miss that window for, for giving the children some input at, at a young age? Um, also at that age, children are obviously a lot uh, more willing to just have a go, to have a play with the language, N not so afraid to make mistakes. And um, as a result of that, and as a result of being able to hear and speak um, with, with all those language sounds, they'll acquire a more nat native learning accent as well. Um, so, really, all you can do at that age, if you don't want to turn them off, obviously, is to make it, is to make it part of everyday life. Um, maybe a particular space, a particular time, but <laughs> just make it fun. Um, songs, stories, games, anything. A friend of mine um, was telling me about a game she plays with her daughter, which is a tickling game, and she won't stop tickling her daughter until she says, arrête, in French. <laughs> A little bit of torture there, but um, <laughs> her daughter sort of turned it around a bit because now she'll go, arrête, and then she'll go, encore une fois. <laughs> so that's something that she really enjoys. And um, uh, I just want to mention that um, my wife and myself have, um, have set up a blog. I'll just write it down here. It's called Lingotastic. And she basically blogs on there about everything to do with early years, language learning, recommendations of great resources that she uses for some of the classes that she runs for for younger children. So um, if you can, pop over to that. The other thing that you'll find there is a link to, um, sorry, just 10 seconds, <laughs> is a link to um, an album that you can stream on various um, streaming services called Mostly German. This is actually my wife recorded this and it's in Obviously, mostly German, as the title says. <laughs> but it's got Spanish, French, Mandarin, Esperanto, uh, yeah, and English on. So that's it, basically. But if you're interested, go there. Thank you. Thank you. The next one, Tracy. Okay, my name is Tracy, and today I want to tell you briefly and abstractly about how to learn like a machine. <laughs> and I don't mean like a robot, uh, I mean like a machine learning algorithm. I mean, uh, a lot of, I've heard people talking to earlier today about the problems with uh, textbooks, instructions, do this, do that, uh, this amazing uh, cases in the German list, 
And I think most of us want to use languages to communicate and not to be robots. So what I'm going to tell you about is learning like a machine learning algorithm. There's a kind of computer program that you can, you don't program it on what to do, you program it on how to deal with data and it will figure out what to do. It will learn on its own and as it runs farther, it will do those things more quickly and more effectively than at the beginning. So how can we do that? Fortunately, there's science for this. Uh, I'm just going to tell you very quickly about some of the main categories and I'd be happy to answer any other questions. I love thinking about this stuff. Number one, organization. This is what you should do before you even start. Um, organizing data makes it much easier to input into a machine learning algorithm and organizing your resources makes it much easier to put into your own brain. I, I loved this uh, case chart because this is, it, uh, this is not it obviously, but go back in time in your memory and look at it because that was such a great concise organization of information. It's much easier for your brain to reference and use that. Uh, when I was starting Russian, I took the time ahead of time to find listening resources, find um, websites, find all my other resources and line those up so that I didn't have to worry about organizing information as I went along. It was already ready for me and then I just had to do it. Step two, get feedback. Uh, this is very important for machine learning algorithms because as they make decisions about the data that you give them, it's very helpful for them to get a yes or a no answer on if that was correct. They take guesses and they see if that's right. This is exactly what we should be doing too. You're not sure how to use a particular word or a phrase? That's okay, try it. If you're talking with someone who understands that language or if you're taking a test or whatever the motivation is, if you have a way of using that in a way where you can tell quickly if that's right or wrong, you will learn more quickly from that. Uh, and that's connected to step three, or not step three, but advice three is throughput. No machine learning algorithm is going to learn a lot from just one or two points of data. You need a lot, you need thousands, you need millions. As much data as you can get, as much feedback as you can get, as many times using that phrase, hearing that phrase as you can get, do it, whatever it takes you to just hear that you know, hundreds, thousands of times, uh, and as a teacher, these are all points that I try to maximize for my students in the classroom. I will choose exercises that give my students as much exposure to these things as possible. Step four, or idea four. Um, I kind of combined two different machine learning algorithm aspects into this one, but it's a combination of um, basically using what you know in different contexts. Native speakers don't just learn that this word means this and you use it in this phrase. Native speakers learn a word in many different contexts for talking about movies, for hanging out with friends. It's a different word if you're talking to someone who is who's sort of more official or it's, it means different things if you're using it with your friends. Use words in all their contexts and this will also help you remember that word. The more associations, the more connections you have with that word, the easier you will find to remember it. Um, last piece of it, or second to last piece of advice, address ambiguity. Machine learning algorithms, even computers, aren't right all the time. They make mistakes, but the way that they deal with that is that they have something to do when they make that mistake. When you make a mistake, don't just give up, don't just feel like you know, you're stupid or you didn't know it. Have a backup plan, even if that backup plan is just asking someone, oh, like, you know, which, which thing was that? How should I learn from that? Or maybe your backup plan is to just describe it in a different way. Maybe your backup plan is to draw a picture and show it to somebody, like, it's okay. Even the best machine learning algorithms make mistakes. So will you. All you have to do is have a plan for what you will do when that happens. And then the, the last thing I want to say to just sort of round that out is to trust yourself. Your brain is an amazing thing. Your brain is handling input data, all kinds of things all around you all the time. And you don't even have to monitor it. You don't have to tell it which vocabulary chart to look at in order to start understanding when people are telling you things in certain contexts, you're just gonna to start to get it. So, and uh, I guess my time is up, but I just wanna encourage everybody to, your, your brain is amazing, you were made for this. So don't let that discourage you. Trust your mind and treat it well.
Salut, euh, je m'appelle Thomas. Euh, je parle en français. Euh, je prends le calois. Et il y a une demande de tout le monde. Il y a une ville avec un nom, un nom très très long. Et euh, qu'est-ce que c'est que ça C'est Grand Vair pour Gwingrich Koker und Dorbuch und das Silja Gokoko. Tu étais dans, mon, dans ma présentation sur la prononciation en 2014 C'est un reproche ou quoi Non Tu te rappelles Um, ce sont uh, 50 et um, une lettre, uh, mais uh, 50 et huit signes parce qu'il y a euh, des, signes, des, des lettres de deux signes en gallois euh, ce sont euh, euh, double L ici et ici 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 et ici et le euh, CH comme en allemand euh, Ici et ici. Um, mais qu'est-ce que c'est que ça Ce n'est pas un, un problème à articuler, mais c'est comme, comme une phrase. Khan, hein. euh, 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 c'est un lieu euh, d'église. Euh, Weir euh, est. C'est euh, le, le forum de euh, Marie, Maire, euh, c'est avec euh, une, une mutation molle ou l'émission. C'est euh, souvent avec des, euh, 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 des noms euh, féminines. Euh, c'est Maire, euh, c'est Marie. Euh, pour, euh, c'est euh, comme euh, poule en anglais, euh, c'est un bassin. Euh, Gwyn, euh, c'est blanc. Euh, et... Euh, Kir, c'est la mutation de Kir, c'est le pluriel de noitier. Noitier, c'est un arbre avec des noix. Noitier. 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 Euh, c'est une avec une euh, singularité. Donc, le euh, single mot c'est euh, le mot simple c'est euh, le pluriel et c'est on euh, euh, donne une suffixe c'est le pluriel euh, c'est le singularité euh, c'est euh, euh, cor corin. pour chercher euh, dans le dictionnaire. Euh, guerre, ici c'est euh, chez. Euh, euh, et go c'est tout. Go. Guerre. Tout, tout c'est euh, l'article. Le, peut-être. Et... Euh, Hurn, c'est fort, 
Et euh, ici, c'est euh, un adjectif. Euh, et, euh, pour et pour euh, son, euh, le mot, c'est un euh, tourbillon, c'est un tourbillon faux. Et Khan, euh, déjà vu, c'est l'église, c'est ce lieu, et le nom de notre saint. Et euh, Orgor, c'est une caverne, et Gor, c'est rouge. Tu peux le dire encore une fois, tout entier, une fois C'est Khan Weil pour Gwengel, Kogerich, Wondrawor, Khan Tessilia, Gogogor. L'église de Sainte-Marie dans un bassin des noirs blancs et toute chair le tourbillon fort. Euh, et euh, l'église de Sainte-Solio avec une caverne rouge. Merci. 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 n'a pas vu la, ma conférence de prononciation en 2014, vous pouvez trouver euh, à l'internet, il y a une vidéo pour euh, apprendre ce mot en chantant. Donc ils ont créé une chanson pour apprendre ce mot. D'accord, merci. Euh, le prochain, c'est... Le suivant, c'est Christopher. Uh, sorry, the next one is Christopher. C'est ok. C'est un miracle This is always the problem of the conference. Everybody is adapting to the language of the previous one. So go on. Je parle que français. Vas-y, vas-y, vas-y. Encore une fois. Everybody got this perfect, right? Okay. Great. I don't know if you've ever been nervous in front of a group of people, but uh, I don't think you've ever been the guy in Germany drawing a swastika on the board. <laughs> That's a whole new level of nervous. So kudos to you, man. Uh, So my name is Christopher Huff, and uh, I make little comic strips and videos on the internet for fun. And um, they're public, so you can look at them if you want. But I'm really interested in this uh, idea of minimalism in languages. So two years ago, at the first one of these in Berlin, I gave a talk on Tokipona. Tokipona is a language that a, a lady and her friends invented in 2001, and it only has 123 words in it total. So. Obviously, you might think, well, how can you possibly express yourself with only 123 words? Well, it's possible. Um, there's only three numbers in it, so you can't really talk about anything, you know, specific with digits. And there's one, two, and five. So once you start talking about, like, Donald Trump's salary, you can't really do a lot with that. But, uh, but I'm really interested in minimalism in general, and it seems like over time, the more of these talks I listen to, the more people are kind of hinting at this, And I'm thinking, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. So, for example, yesterday, uh, Malachi Rimpin, who also makes a comic strip on the internet, which you can look at if you want, it's public, uh, he gave a talk where he said less is more, which is kind of what this is, and he was saying that you can, you can do a lot with very little, so you don't have to necessarily have all of this flowery, expressionistic vocabulary and all these amazing, you know, this uh, incredible number of words in your lexicon in order to make yourself understood, because communication is the whole point of learning a language in the first place, uh, aside from just you know, reading a book or something alone in your room. Um, so I wanted to talk about attempts at making minimalism work in languages. Um, it's kind of a project I've had since last year. Um, it doesn't work so well with Chinese, I'll tell you that, not that much I learned. But um, I'll just go through kind of like historical examples of people trying to do this. So one of the things that uh, Malachi mentioned yesterday in his talk was a simple English. It's not officially even a thing, it's not, it has no definition, um, but it's like over a thousand, maybe uh, roughly two thousand words in English that are seen as like essential, basic words that you need to know. And it's kind of um, a project for making people who are learning English, uh, making it easier for them to read and use English because you only need these words. So, for example, there's a Wikipedia that's in simple English. It's simple.wikipedia.org. And you can read about articles, maybe things that you don't really understand, like the Large Hadron Collider is something, I don't know anything about this at all. But if you read it in the simple English Wikipedia, you might think, oh, okay, that's kind of, that makes sense to me, even though I don't know anything about it. So that's what that's for. Um, there's also a radio station called The Voice of America, VOA for short. And they use simple English in all of their broadcasts, all of their publications, so that anyone around the world that listens to this radio station can understand them easier. So they're not going to use words like gesticulation and stuff. They're not going to use these incredible words. 
Um, so unless you're someone like uh, Niels Everson, who gets uh, an incredible thrill out of learning 30,000 words in a language that he won't use, um, <laughs> you might be interested, like I am, in going the lazy way with any language you learn and saying, what's the least amount of work I can possibly put into doing this and still get some benefit out of it? And if you think that, like I do, you might have something in common with a guy called Charles K. Ogden, who was from the UK, bless his heart. And uh, he, made a, he had this idea called basic English. Basic English is different from simple. Basic has only 800 words in, oh, hello, that's not an eight. Only 800 words in the lexicon total. And he thought these are the basic ones that you need to be able to talk about anything. Um, so you can find information about this. It was popular for like a decade, as most things in the UK are. Uh, but you can still find information about it. Uh, people still use it in the internet. And um, also, again, Malachi yesterday mentioned a, a book called The Thing Explainer by a comic strip artist named Randall Monroe who makes XKCD, which is a really famous one. The Thing Explainer explains things that are really massively complicated, like space shuttles and how they operate and how they jettison pieces off in space and send them back down and all this with very, 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 very minimal vocabulary. Only like a, a few hundred words. I think it's like a thousand flat. So this is all bearing in mind the same idea. I believe that Tokipona is an even more useful one than these because it's the smallest one that I've ever found. If you get any lower than 120, it starts to become ridiculous where, you know, you're saying you have thing, action, it's so abstract, it's, it's like you can't even talk about anything. So I recommend looking up Tokipona, which is a language for minimalism, and if you want to talk about this topic, come and find me and I'll teach you something. Actually, the first experiment was written, was has been translated also into German. Has it? Yes, using the 1,000 simplest uh, German words. It means that any complicated German word has been actually split <laughs> into its origin basic words. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Because any German words is based on the basic uh, 1,000 uh, German words. Okay. Okay, so the next one is uh, Dani. Sorry, it's Yeah, as you can tell it, then you come to me. Yeah, that's what I have to thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I Thank you, Miro. I will speak Deutsch. And Miro has me now, during the Lightning Talks, zu einem Talk verführt und jetzt bin ich hier und äh, werde ein bisschen erzählen. Äh, ich habe letztes Jahr einen Lightning Talk gehalten zum Thema Krimis und äh, danach sind noch ganz viele Leute zu mir gekommen und haben mit mir über dieses Thema gesprochen und ganz interessant, äh, auch dieses Jahr sind die Leute zu mir gekommen und haben gesagt, was ist mit deinem Krimi und was machst du mit Krimis? Und jetzt erzähle ich halt was von Krimis, wenn Miro sagt, ich soll was erzählen. Äh, viele Leute haben mich dann gefragt, wie kann ich mit Krimis Sprachen lernen? Äh, blöde Frage, äh, wie kann mir das beim Sprachenlernen helfen? Und dann habe ich darüber nachgedacht. Und natürlich, wenn ich etwas lese, dann hilft mir das mit der Sprache. No, no. Ja, also wenn ich etwas lese, das mir Spaß macht, dann hilft mir das bei der Sprache. Aber äh, Krimis können mir noch bei etwas ganz anderem helfen. Und zwar bekomme ich ein besseres Verständnis der Kultur der Länder, in denen die Sprache gesprochen wird. Und zwar kann ich zum Beispiel über soziale Probleme lernen. Ein großes Thema in Krimis sind soziale Probleme. Ja, sehr oft geht es um Drogen, es geht um Gewalt in der Familie, es geht um Mafia-Strukturen. Ja. Also ich kenne zum Beispiel einen, einen Krimi, der wird auf Deutsch geschrieben, glaube ich, der spielt in Triest. Und Triest ist ja an der Grenze zum Balkan und da geht es sehr oft um die Balkanmafia. Und ich wüsste nichts über die Balkanmafia, aber jetzt weiß ich etwas, was in dieser Region äh, Teil der sozialen Probleme ist. Ja, und das hilft mir auch, das Ganze, äh, den, die Kultur dieser Region besser zu verstehen. Also mit Krimis kann ich auch soziale Probleme einer Region äh, erfahren. Und ich denke auch, dass das wichtige Informationen sind, wenn wir in eine Kultur eintauchen wollen. Und normalerweise erfahren wir nur die positiven Dinge über die Kultur. Ja, die positiven Dinge von Deutsch, ja, Bier trinken, super. Ja, gut. Aber es gibt auch 
andere negativere Dinge und ich denke, das ist auch ein Teil des Kulturverständnisses. Außerdem kann ich mit Krimis einen Blick in die andere Gesellschaft werfen. Ja, es liegt in der Natur von Krimis, dass sie Charakter, starke Charaktere zeichnen und dass sie stark eingebettet werden in eine soziale Situation. Und hier kann ich einfach viel mehr erfahren, wie die Gesellschaft aufgebaut ist. Ich lese zum Beispiel viele Cozy Crimes, die spielen so Downton Abbey mäßig, so 1920 bis 1935 in England. Ja, total super. Also wer Downton Abbey liebt, ja, ich habe ein paar Krimis für euch. Und da kann ich in eine Gesellschaftsstruktur eintauchen, die ich sonst nicht kenne. Ja, also die British Upper Class zwischen dem Ersten und dem Zweiten Weltkrieg ist so ein bisschen eigen. Ja? Und so kann ich eintauchen. Oder auch in moderne soziale Strukturen. Ich lese Krimis, die in Frankreich spielen. Ja? Und wenn die, die Geschichten dort beschreiben, was die Leute so machen, angefangen vom Frühstück bis hin den ganzen Tag, da das Abendessen mit Wein und viel Kochen, bla bla bla, das, das erfahre ich sonst nicht. Ja? Ich habe keinen Zugang zu dieser Gesellschaft. Ich bin ganz, ganz selten in Frankreich. Und äh, so kann ich aber an dieser Gesellschaft teilhaben und etwas darüber erfahren. Und äh, wer Krimi-Tipps möchte, gerne danach bei mir. Und danke nochmal Miro, <lacht> dass ich hier was erzählen durfte. Danke Anna. Äh, Quanti parlano italiano? Quanti vogliono praticare l'italiano? Mm, ok, allora, eh, in, eh, anche tu? No. Allora, eh, stiamo organizzando un seminario poliglotta eh, fra un mese in Sardegna, eh, si chiama Limbas, eh, Limbas in sardo vuol dire lingue, e eh, sarà dal 17 al 19 giugno, venerdì, domenica, eh, ci, sia, ci saremo eh, io, eh, Judith Meyer e Sophie Kaflisch, e faremo, eh, ci sarà, diciamo, il seminario alla base è rivolto a eh, studenti eh, delle scuole superiori, quindi non, è, diciamo, non aspettatevi il livello che possiamo avere qui a livello di poliglossia, chiaramente. Eh, ci saranno delle conversazioni in inglese, francese, tedesco, spagnolo e italiano. Eh, un'introduzione all'esperanto, un'introduzione al sardo, un'introduzione al cinese, eh, come imparare le lingue in rete e, dimenticato una cosa, un'introduzione alla eh, fonetica <ride> e ci saranno dei canti poliglotti, dei giochi poliglotti e, e un'escursione un eh, nella zona archeologica, eh, è vicino a Cagliari il, il posto, quindi si, va, si arriva in aereo fino a Cagliari e poi è un'oretta di treno. E cos'altro? Eh, ci sono soltanto 10 posti disponibili, quindi eh, diciamo, attualmente ci sono i, i partecipanti, i ragazzi sono a 25 o, 3, o 30, eh, però abbiamo previsto una decina di posti ulteriori per chi volesse venire se andate sul gruppo facebook Polyglots the community o Polyglots eh, sotto eventi trovate la descrizione e il programma e i contatti eh, che altro eh, saremo in un ostello eh, ottima cucina sarda eh, siamo al mare quindi il posto è molto bello e credo di aver detto tutto non so se avete domande quanto, quanto abbiamo ancora? Ah, domande? grazie Cesco sì, domande il costo di... ecco bravo infatti è, è come, più o meno come qua 75, circa 75 euro al giorno sarebbe 45 il posto eh, in camera doppia il posto letto in camera doppia sono 45 euro, più eh, compreso di colazione e un pasto o pranzo o cena, più 15 euro se vuoi anche l'altro pasto e più 15 euro per il nei giorni del seminario, che sono tre, quindi poi se uno vuole fermarsi di più non, non c'è. 
quindi tutto compreso sono 75 euro al giorno sostanzialmente e, diciamo mi sembra che sia l'offerta per i primi tre e poi magari passa a 80 insomma, vabbè, una cosa diversa, no? i dettagli non lo ricordo comunque più o meno questo sì? Oh, ok, yeah, uh, it's, I talked in Italian because it's uh, aimed mainly at people that speak Italian. Anyway, 17th to, to 19th June in Sardinia, uh, polyglot workshop uh, um, for three days in Sant'Antioco near Cagliari, so near the airport of Cagliari and uh, will be run by uh, Judith Meyer, Sophie Kaflisch and me and uh, there will be conversations in uh, English, German, uh, Spanish, French and Italian introduction to Sardinian, Esperanto and Chinese um, uh, maybe also Korean and then uh, polyglot games, polyglot uh, songs and uh, What else? Uh, I have phonetics, introduction to phonetics. Yeah. So there will be a series of blocks of 40 minutes, so short lectures, and it is aimed to local students. So I would say for the polyglots, it, mainly is, it is mainly a good holiday with excellent food, uh, sea, and uh, mingling, and uh, Probably the most interesting things would be Italian, practicing Italian, um, an introduction to Sardinian, Esperanto, Chinese, phonetics, and this stuff. Thank you. Thank you. So, and, uh, if you want details, uh, go under events in the polyglot groups or polyglot, the community group on Facebook under events. Thank you. you can switch it off. I'm going to allow me to take the last spot. Uh, first uh, short question, is anybody still using a classical keyboard to type text? Anyone? One, two, three? I hope everyone is still using a classical uh, keyboard. Uh, it's a hardware keyboard <coughs> with... Yeah, great. Okay, uh, does anyone use uh, the, the keyboard to type in more Europe, in several European languages that are you simultaneously, not simultaneously, but within one text? Uh, and uh, use, and uh, these languages have different uh, accent, umloid, uh, and so on. What are you doing? To, if you are writing a German text and then you write something in Polish or French? Georg? So I use a keyboard layout called US Extended, uh -huh. where you can, uh, where you just have the US keyboard, but you can type any uh, diacritic using the alt keys, and then some, you have to combine it, like okay. the umlaut, alt U, and then the A makes the A umlaut. Okay, you look at him, he's a former pianist, he can do such movements with alt and Q and so on. I cannot do it. I uh, another idea? May I say, I, I have an internet page about exactly that. If you go to Young and Record... Okay, George you talk, uh, the next sliding talks about it. Any idea? <laughs> <laughs> I, I use uh, Linux, it's a compose key on the German keyboard. Okay, does anyone know the compose key? No, okay, so I will go to talk about it a little bit. Uh, I was born in Czechoslovakia in the times as it, it was still Czechoslovakia and we didn't have uh, an operating system supporting our alphabet. So we were all using US keyboards. Then in the 90s I could use a Slovak uh, keyboard uh, which was a little bit different from the US because it was not QWERTY, it was QWERTS. Mm -hmm. And uh, the numbers you had to type them with a shift. Mm -hmm. And also some, uh, some brackets and so on, it looked like uh, somehow different. <laughs> During my studies, I was unfortunately forced to use the French keyboard. <laughs> yes, Azerti. With a point under shift and with M in the second row, to, totally to the right, uh, and other obscurities. Uh, later, I had to use the German keyboard, and now I'm absolutely happy with the standard US keyboard. And I am writing everyday German, French, Slovak, Czech, Polish, somehow, sometimes <coughs> Spanish. Uh, but I'm still keep uh, using only Latin alphabet. I'm not really writing, a l r typing a lot in uh, Chinese or in uh, or in Russian. So uh, in uh, Linux and uh, 
if there are some other operating systems, yes, Macintosh, I think, uh, maybe also in others, uh, just uh, type, uh, just Google for the name of your operating system and Compose Key, C-O-M-P-O-S-E. You can define some not used uh, key on your keyboard, for example, the uh, the right, this menu key or this right Windows uh, key, and then you just hit it once, then you type two other letters. So, for example, my last name is Shedivi, the first one is S with Karen. I do Compose, C, S. C is for Karen, S is normal letter. If I want to type uh, the Polish W, it is Compose, slash, L. Uh, for the French accent grave, uh, it is this Bectic, so it's Compose, Bectic, A. And all these uh, special marks, uh, special letters, you have them on your, special keys, you have them on your US uh, keyboard directly. US keyboard is perfect uh, for uh, the most standard editor you can find for VI. Is anybody using it? Great. And uh, also you can use this for other typographical marks. So for example, if you need ellipses, three dots, you do compo you make a compose uh, dot dot. If you need uh, some flashes, it's uh, compose uh, minus uh, greater than and, and so on. So uh, it works uh, for most uh, European uh, languages using uh, Latin alphabet. Uh, and maybe if you find it, uh, find how, how find out how to do it, uh, how to use it also for Greek or a Cyrillic uh, alphabet, uh, just let me know. Uh, I'm keen to, I'm happy to learn new things. Thank you very much.